Deja vu. Good morning. But in doing so, 
Somebody just walked up to me out of nowhere. It was a man, a male, older, older than me. And he says, you're a Christian, aren't you? Uh, it caught me off guard. I said, yes, sir. How can I help you? I need prayer. Uh, I have a need. And we sat there in the middle of Walmart talking and praying about his issue. God will lead people to you. But even more so, God will lead you to others. You don't know what people are going through nowadays. You don't know just what's in their life. The hurt, the pain, the anguish, the loss. Are you listening to God and where He's truly leading you and truly calling you to do? Now these friends of the blind man are compassionate enough to see a person's need. Have faith enough to believe that Jesus can make a difference. Sitting here in the congregation today, do you truly believe that God can heal? We prayed for Michelle's father today. We prayed for Pastor Sharkey today before, or during the service, during the invitation, or the, the announcements. But in that prayer, when we say it, are we just saying, God, heal this person. God, please touch them. God, please do your will. Or do we truly believe it? We say, God, I know you can do this. I know you can heal them. I know you can touch them. God, please. How much faith is behind your words? Do you have faith enough to believe that Jesus can make a difference? Do you take the initiative to get your friends, your family, to come to Jesus? Well, these people, these friends of his, took the initiative to get their friend to Jesus. And even pled to Jesus on his behalf. What a difference friends make. Friends can either help people get closer to Jesus or lead them further away. You know, it took me a while to understand just how friends affect your life. Growing up, I had some really good friends and I had some really bad friends. Even after I became a Christian and I came and gave myself over to Christ, I still had those so-called friends that said, hey, let's go have a drink. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. They're leading me farther away from Christ. But I had those friends too that said, let's have this conversation. Let's sit down and talk about the Bible. Let's talk about what God's doing in your life today. What kind of friend are you today? Are you leading people further away from Christ or closer? The most common way people get to know Jesus or get close to Him and hear His Word hasn't changed in 2,000 years. It's this personal invitation, personal relationship. It's friends telling friends and inviting friends to bring friends to church. I was talking Wednesday night in the youth about just how much things are different in the church today than they were when I was a little kid. I still remember the first Baptist church I went to in which there was constantly large groups of kids when I was in Sunday school. And most of those kids weren't constant comers to church. They didn't always come. They were there because they were brought by a friend. We had challenges. Bring one, two, three, bring five friends to church today. We understood what it meant to get somebody in the service. We understood why we needed them there. To spread the gospel, to lead them closer to Jesus Christ. Today, we say we need to start inviting our neighbors, our friends, our family, get them in the church so we can get God's word to them. We have online service to where we can go live on Facebook, on YouTube, and invite people to even listen in this way, which we didn't have back then. <coughs> but yet, we still find the same people in the service sitting in the pews. We have 
a choice of where we're spending eternity. Our friends and family have that same choice. Some of them may not know it. It's our job to spread the gospel and help them in that decision. Even in the 21st century into the pandemic, churches are experiencing growth where people are inviting churches, or inviting people. Churches that are shrinking or declining are less likely to have people who are regularly inviting others. It's something that's always on my heart. So, like I said, Wednesday night we spoke to the youth that now it's easier than ever because it's as simple as sending an email. You don't even have to have that face-to-face -face discussion with somebody any longer. I, I know we're always talking about, uh, and in college, they said that the reason that most people don't go out there and, and minister to others, most people don't follow God's Word in being a disciple of the world, is because they're afraid of rejection. What kind of rejection when you have an email or a message that's saying God loves you? Today in church, we spoke about this verse. Read it. Tell me what you think or if you have any questions. Send a text or a link with a prayer. A sermon. We have it on Facebook. We have it on YouTube. Send that sermon. Say, well, watch this. It touched me. Tell me if you get something out of it. A brief word from the sermons. This blessed and helped me, so I want to share it with you because I care about you. It's as simple as that. As friends, we can either move people closer or further away from God. And until we realize that, we're just sitting here stalemating. We can all be asking God to make us like the friends of the story. We can ask God to regularly help me see who I should bring to Jesus. We can pray for a compassionate heart that sees, that notices the needs of others and pray for faith big enough to believe that Christ can make a difference and do all things. Do you truly believe that today? Being a caring, faith-filled friend means people willing to take that initiative and pray for people that Christ will touch their lives. Now, I'll be honest with you. If I don't pray with you right there whenever I say I'm going to pray for you, a lot of times it doesn't happen. I forget. I have a bad memory. So, I've got to the point to where when I say I'm going to pray for you, I pray for you then. It's something that is truly important, prayer. And if you truly believe in the power of Christ, take that person's hand when they ask for it. Even if they don't ask for prayer, they come up and say, I've got a grandmother that's healed. Yeah. Hey, let me go ahead and pray with you right now. God has the power to do this. Now Jesus responds in a caring way to the friend's request, and he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Now can you imagine being this blind man? What would it be like to have Jesus take your very hand and lead you somewhere even though you could not see? I know I've been blindfolded for birthday parties and stuff before. But I didn't like it. <laughs> Can't see. I, I, I like surprises sometimes, but I like to know where I'm going. Imagine this blind man being led by the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Think about your own life. Where is Jesus leading you? Where is Jesus leading me at this very moment? In this season of my life and your life, will you trust the Lord enough to follow where he leads you? I was touched last Sunday. We had somebody come here and say, God was leading me to this church. God was leading me to the service. God called me here enough to where the individual rode his bicycle to the church. We have 
have people that come from town. We have some people that come from the beach to come to church service. They have a heart that's just yearning to know where Jesus is leading them. How far will you go? Where will you go? On Sunday when we pray, we pray for the church service. We pray for the pastor. We pray financially. It takes money to lead a church. It takes money to have this church, the lights on, the air conditioner, the heater. We pray for support for our missionaries. We also need to acknowledge that they're not only ones that lead, led by Jesus to new places, new ventures, and new opportunities. We also need to be open and willing to go where Jesus wants to lead us, to places we cannot see yet. So as a minister, that's the same for me. God calls you to other places. Doesn't mean as much as I would love to be here the rest of my life, the rest of my ministry, leading this church, the most loving church that I know of, to Christ. If God calls me elsewhere, I've got to go. Unfortunately, there are some pastors that hang on and are comfortable and don't want to. We've got to follow Christ. When we pray for support for our missionaries, we also need to acknowledge that Jesus is in control. Now in this, Jesus uses saliva, which was a common home remedy, and laid his hands on the man and asked, can you see anything? Now, if you're blind and someone lays their hands on you, you know, I, I, I'll i tell you, I used to hate it when my mom spit on her hand. And, let me get that, let me get that, you know, or spit on a paper towel. Mom, stop, Mom, you're embarrassing me. <coughs> but imagine Jesus, Jesus doing it, placing his hands over your eyes. Or if you have another issue. You know, I have I'm, it's no secret to my ailments. I have diverticulitis. I have kidney disorders. If God came and put his hands wherever it was that I hurt, imagine imagine what was in your mind. What was in his mind. Think about your own life. Where is Jesus leading you at this moment? In verse 24, it says, And the man looked up and said, I can not I can see people, but they look like trees walking. Trees walking. The man's response tells us that he could see before, so he, didn't, he wasn't born blind. So before whatever happened to take away his vision, because he knows what people and trees look like, he was able to tell us, I'm able to start seeing something. He wasn't blind from birth, just like the man in John 9. So here's another important point to remember. When everything wasn't perfect for the first time, neither Jesus nor the man gave up, quit, or walked away saying the situation was hopeless. We often pray one single prayer. Oh well, God didn't answer it. I give up. No. Faith. Continue. When you conversation with your parents, with your, your loved ones, do you just say, oh no, I don't want to have a conversation today and talk and that's it. The rest of the week is my time. No. Jesus is our Father. We're going to have that conversation constantly. Sometimes I wonder if we give up on ourselves. And on God too soon. I wonder how many times we have been frustrated or disappointed when things didn't initially turn out how we hoped in our lives so that we walked away before Jesus even had the chance or opportunity to touch us. Or to touch us again. Before the situation was actually finished or completed. We forget that everything happens in God's time. 
I know there's a lot of times that people are ill, especially with the COVID now, this pandemic. And we pray for them. But in the back of your head, are you really thinking God's going to heal this person? Or are we thinking we're going through the motions? We know what's going to happen. We see it on the news. We see it on TV. We hear it on the, we, we're reading it in the papers. It seems like today we have more faith in these masks than we do God. We wear the mask to protect us from COVID, protect us from the illness, and to stop us from spreading. But God is a true physician. Now, I'm not telling you, especially you out there, to not wear your mask. I'm not telling you that. I wear it at work constantly. I wear it when I go to Walmart or wherever I go to shop. But what I'm saying is, if we had as much faith in God as we do in something to stop the spread of a disease, an illness, we wouldn't have to go today. You'd be eradicated. And not by some vaccine. What does the Bible say about faith? It's the size of a mustard seed, you can what? Amen. Where's your faith today? Is your faith lacking to where you're not even moving? Or do you truly have that faith to where you're grabbing God's hand and letting Him lead you to where you go? If you're feeling down, discouraged, or depressed, don't make the mistake of walking away from faith in Jesus. And even God too soon. Jesus isn't discouraged and He's not giving up on us or deserting us. He didn't desert this man. When he covered his eyes and the guy said, Oh, I see people, but they look like trees walking. God didn't say, That's good enough. Man, it, that, that's good enough. You're, you're, you're at least seeing. I'll see you later. I got other things to do. No! He put his hands over his eyes again. Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again and he saw everything clearly. Don't give up. Just like the word of God, it comes from Jonah a second time, which is a great act of grace. So Jesus touches the man a second time. Sometimes progress, healing, change, and transformation is not instantaneous. We want that. Today's life, we have all these microwaves. We have everything that's instantaneous. We get it here. We got instant rice, one minute rice. One minute is too long for me. I want it in 30 seconds, and then my next week I want it in 20 seconds, and so on and so forth. We have instant pots. We have all this stuff to make things instant to a minute. But sometimes it's a process that re re requires a little bit of patience. Relationships require patience. Forgiveness requires patience. Healing requires patience. Now, there are two levels of meaning to seeing this passage. The first is what I mentioned to begin with, physical vision. Jesus has the power to heal the blind. He is restoring the sight to the man. And, and it is reminiscent of the statements of the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah sorry, about what will happen in God's good future. Isaiah 29, 18-20 says, on that day, the deaf shall hear the words of a scroll. And out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. The meat shall obtain flesh, uh, fresh joy in the Lord. And the neediest people shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. For the tyrant shall be no more, and the scoffer shall cease to be. All those alert... To do evil shall be cut off. Isaiah 35 5 says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. The opening of blind eyes is one of the features of God's coming time of deliverance. That Jesus is opening the eyes of the blind is a sight of who he truly is. Again, there are two levels of meaning to seeing in this passage. Like I said, the first is physical. The second is a perception or understanding. So it's important to understand the context of this passage. 
The disciples in Mark 8, 17 through 21 are discussing the fact that they have no bread. Jesus rebukes them. He says, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and fail to see? You can see now. Your eyesight's now, but yet you still don't see what's going on around you. Do you have ears and fail to hear? I've heard that so often from my wife. I have ears, but I don't listen. <laughs> and do you not remember? When I brought the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? The disciples had said it had been twelve. And seven for the four thousand. How many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? And they said to him, Seven. Then he said to them, Do you not yet understand? This passage sets up a section in Mark's Gospel on discipleship and the way of Jesus that runs from Mark chapter 8, 22 through Mark 10, 52. And it begins and it ends with the restoration of sight and the sword. In Mark 10, 51 through 52, it says that Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. Immediately. Immediately before Mark 8, 22 that we were talking about today, we have a blindness of the disciples even. Not just the man that was brought to them, but the disciples were blind. And I'm not talking physical blindness. But they were blind to see everything that was happening around them. Peter even begins to see, but healing the blind man. Peter begins to see, it, but imperfectly, not crystal clearly. He will need a further touch from Jesus to see clearly who he is. Who are you today? Where are you going? Three passionate predictions of teaching about discipleship represent his second touch. His laying his hands on the disciples again so they can truly see who he is and what he must do. This story comes in the center of Mark's Gospel. If you're hearing or reading Mark's Gospel, to this point we've seen Jesus' wondrous Mark working powers, His authority, His ability to forgive sins, His popularity with the crowd. But now we start learning that it's only a partial and complete vision of who He truly is, of who Christ is. When we're touched by Jesus, He'll lead us to see Him. He'll lead us to see other people. He'll lead us to see a world around us and in a new way. I hear a lot of people complaining nowadays about the presidential election, about COVID, about the United States and where we're going, about the world. But if you rely on Jesus and you ask for that clear vision, that sight, you will. See the world around you in a whole new way. Sometimes we're more like these disciples and Peter, who thought he saw clearly. Sometimes we're like the blind man who knew that he didn't see clearly. In these passages from Mark 8, 22, all the way through verse, uh, chapter 10, uh, 52, Jesus is present, presents, uh, presented confronting his disciples with a Christ who must be rejected, must suffer, and must die. And only then will he be raised. He speaks of a discipleship that consists not of Power and glory, but a lowly service and loss, loss of life, his own life. Jesus' way leads.
seats to a cross. Not to the best seats, but to the cross. The goal of Jesus is leading us forward and touching us a second time. It's to help us see God. Not only that, but to help us see ourselves, who we truly are. Help us see other people, who they are, what they need. And even to see the tragedy of life happening all around us. It's almost like Jesus has to spit in the disciples' eyes in order to get them to see clearly who He is and what will happen. And they've been walking with Him in this time. Are you walking with Christ today and you still don't see who He is, what He is, what you're being called for? Once we can see clearly, our task is to carry on the role of the friends who brought the blind man to Jesus so that He might touch them. We are to bring people to Jesus and ask Him to touch and lead them too. We can invite Jesus to take our hand and lead us. And Jesus can heal us or even help us to see the world in a new way. Through His eyes, through His eyes of faith, compassion, service, and sacrifice. We don't like to hear that word, sacrifice. We don't like to hear being humble. We don't like to hear when we talk about prayer and saying, get on our knees. We'd rather stand, eyes open, eyes, whatever, sit down. It's time for us to humble ourselves before the Lord. It's time for us to stop speaking and listen. My mom tried to teach me several things growing up. Some stuck, some didn't. But if I continue to talk the entire time that she's trying to teach me, I would have never learned anything. But it's when you shut up and listen, have that silence, that you begin to learn. I can tell you this is something that I struggle with myself. We all have the nature in us to deflect. Someone says, why did you do this? Or you should have been doing this. I, I wasn't there. I didn't do that. I didn't. No. Listen. How can you answer? How can you do anything until you've heard the whole story that the person's talking? How can you follow Christ if you're not listening to the whole story that He's trying to tell you of where He wants you to be? Where He's leading you? What you are to do? Have you lost your sight today? If you lost your sight, what would you miss seeing the most? I would miss seeing my family. I would miss seeing my lovely wife. I would miss seeing each and every one of you here in this service every time the doors are open. I would miss the word. When it comes to understanding Jesus, are you just struggling to see? Are you like the blind man the first time? Are you seeing the blurred shapes? Or are you enjoying a clear vision of what God's calling you for? I've told you my testimony many, many times about when I was called to Christ and when I was led into the ministry. I ran the opposite way. Then and now, I still am not worthy. But it took me seeing the vision of what Christ was doing with my life to understand it doesn't matter if you're worthy or not. Jesus is putting you in this position for a reason, even to use your past to help lead people. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter what you're doing now. If you're forgiven, you have that eternal salvation in heaven. But even more so, you have that testimony. And y'all wonder why I'm on a testimony kick every Sunday night and there all the time, constantly. Because that testimony of what you've done in your past, no matter how bad it was, somebody else has been down that same path. That testimony can truly lead them 
to Christ. You hear people all the time, I don't want to step foot in that church. I'll burn the walls down when I step in because of you know, all the stuff I've done. The, the, the church will collapse or whatever the excuse is. Let them know, brother, all sin is equal in God's eyes. It doesn't matter what you did. I've been there. I've done it too. God forgave me and He will forgive you. Open their eyes. Let them see clearly just what kind of God we serve. Where do you think Jesus is leading you at this very moment? Or have you already seen where Jesus is leading you and you ran away like I did? You still have that opportunity to follow where he has you going. Can you see where he may be taking you today? Do you trust him even if you can't see where he's leading you? Are you blind? Do you have that blindfold on your eyes or your hands on your eyes and you're walking these steps here and if I fall? No, I trust God. Are you trusting where he's leading you today? We're all called to play the same role as people. As Christians, we're all called to play the same role as these friends in the story who brought the blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. Who are you actively seeking to bring closer to Jesus? I'll close with a story that I talked about before with my grandpa. That's one time that I honestly felt like giving up. My grandfather believed in aliens. He believed that we were all from different planets. He believed in a lot of things. But the one thing that caught me off guard was he could quote the Bible from memory. And he could tell you why he believed in aliens and what different verses meant. So much so, if you weren't in God's Word, it would sway you to his belief. I continued to try to minister to him for a long time, from the time that I became a Christian. At that point, I was going to East Chelsea Baptist Church in Tampa, Florida. I tried many of times to get my grandfather to come to church with me. To the point that I felt depressed. I felt like I lost because it never happened. Even the day that I finally stopped running for the ministry call and I was ordained in East Chelsea Baptist Church in Tampa, he didn't come. He had those excuses of what would happen if he stepped into a church. Fast forward almost 20 years later, he wasn't expected to live much longer. He had Alzheimer's and dementia. Nothing destroyed my heart more than knowing I had a family member who I truly loved, who raised me, and didn't believe in Christ. So I knew where he was going. He was blind to the life that he had. He was blind to the path that he was on. And I always gave up. You can ask Jackie. I still prayed for him. I got up here and sung songs. A prayer for a friend. To where I couldn't even make it through the songs. Because I was filled up with tears. Because every time I sung it. He kept popping into my head. As most of you know. That song is talking about a friend. That doesn't know Christ. And we've been trying to lead him constantly or her. And constantly Christ is being rejected by that individual or a friend. So we finally say, God, it's in your hands. There's nothing I can do. So I started praying. I didn't give up faith. No matter how much my heart and my mind was saying that it's never going to happen. 
One day we got a phone call. That phone call was from my mom saying, you'll never believe what just happened. Okay. What happened? Your grandpa accepted Christ into his heart. What? In no way. As hard as I've tried, the scripture I've quoted, how many times I've talked to him and he's just shrugged me off saying, let's stop talking about that and talk about something else. But no. Somebody else came and prayed with him and led him to Christ. And you could see that change in his life. Something that he wanted nothing to do with in the Bible, in Scripture, in sermons, and watching or listening or going to church. At this point of his life, he didn't even leave the home because he couldn't. But he had every TV in the house turned to a different church channel. A different sermon was preaching. Every TV that he had in his house had something on. You could see the change in his life. Even to the point to where it was his last couple days. He had a smile on his face. I remember hugging him and crying because I didn't want to let him go. And him patting my back saying, it's okay. It's okay. Because he knew where he was going. He knew he had that eternal salvation. He knew Jesus Christ was coming for him. How amazing, how exciting is it to have someone to change your life completely and now they know. And now you know. And you smile because you know all that time was not for naught. Because you planted that seed in their heart and their life. Even though you are not the one to reap, it's still happening. You may have a friend or family in your life today, or someone that you don't even know, someone you consider an enemy, that doesn't know Christ, and is living a life that you know is going down the wrong path. It may be a friend that never changed. And every time you're around them, they're still dragging you down. Don't give up. Is God leading you to them or is God leading you to Him? Saying, bring them to me. Pray to me. Let me know what you truly have in your heart for this individual. Don't give up. The same goes for your life. Where is Jesus leading you, guiding you? Is His hand still reaching out to you, saying, follow me, come with me? I've got such great things for you. i got such great things right here at First Baptist Fountain for you. i got such great things at the Bay County or wherever He sends you for missions. Stop being fearful. Start being faithful. We're going to have an invitation today. If today you find yourself as the blind man that can't see at all, you have health issues like me. I, I have many of them. You can come forward and we can pray for that healing. I have faith that God will heal you. Ultimately, it's His will. But I can tell you, my faith is greater than a mustard seed that He will touch you. Are you blind, but you see the blurry visions, visions like I do now? Can you see the path, but you can't see it to the point to where you understand? I'll pray with you. I'll get Brother Ronnie to come and talk with you. Hope you understand just what it is we have to do in the Bible. Start to get a headache when we put these back on. Or are you truly faithful and you're the one that's like, God, I'm ready. I know who you're calling me to lead. I know where you're wanting me to go. I'm tired of running. We'll pray. You don't have to come forward. You can pray where you are now. But I pray. Regardless, that we start truly having that faith in Christ. 
not just for our lives, for this church, for this community. I love that sign, the Pentecostal church down the street, bringing Christ back to Fountain. Christ never left Fountain. We just walked away from Him. It's time for us to regain our vision and start heading back towards Him. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you today. I thank you for this message that you put in my heart. God, I pray that it's such somebody's heart today. I know it's such mine. Father, I pray that whoever is not able here to be here today, for whatever reason, I lift them up to you. Lord, I thank you for the letter for the postcard for Miss Betty and Mr. Paul. We miss them so. Help them, Lord. Lord, Michelle's father, I know you can guide the hands of those physicians. I know you can guide his heart and Michelle's heart and others. Father, I pray that you touch and heal him. Father, I pray you give me the sight to see where you're leading me. I just thank you so much. We pray for Pastor Sharkey in the healing, Lord. We miss him today. We miss the word being preached by him as well. Father, thank you. Thank you for each individual you brought to this church, Lord. We've seen the blessings that you bestowed upon this church for the talents you've given. Continue, Lord. Continue to bless us. We thank you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.